I didn't want to be sick. Mm. And, and I figured out that there was stuff you needed to do to not be sick. As time has gone on, we now have this epidemic. I mean, it's worldwide. The United States, I'm sorry to say, has exported their bad health and their big food, bad food, mm. to the whole world. Welcome to Moving Through Menopause. It's wonderful to have you with us. And I'm talking today with Lynn Bowman. I read that you are living proof that you can cook, eat, sleep, laugh, and walk your way out of type 2 diabetes. I must say, you look the picture of health right now, Lynn. Thank you. And let me just say, Philippa, that, that people say, well, do you want to talk about your age? Heck yeah. You know, th yes, because that's the whole point. I'm going to be 77 in a month. This is what it's all about is if you're going to be 77, you know, get there to have some fun. And I'm grateful and happy, believe me, to get here. Um, I, I didn't always know that that was going to be the case. Right. So so let's do this. You know, let's let's be in our 70s and 80s and 90s and be moving and dancing and having as much fun as we can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like the sound of that. I mean, you look so healthy, but you're obviously feeling healthy, and that's the most important thing. I feel absolutely great. And, you know, let's not kid each other. When you do arrive at a certain age, it takes a little longer to maybe get up out of that chair. You think about it a little more. Getting out of bed in the morning is always, okay, am I breathing? Yeah, good. Okay. Can I move? Great. Okay. But you just don't take it for granted, certainly, any of it. And and you have to work at it maybe a little more. So yes, being of a certain age requires a certain discipline, I think, about what you eat and what you do. But you know what? The earlier you start, the better off you're going to be. So I'm here to encourage anyone who would like to be old someday <laughs> with some style, hopefully, um, that you need to be doing some stuff. Yeah. So it, it sounds like you got to a place where you were not particularly healthy um, and had to make some changes. Is that, is that right? Yes and no. Um, like a lot of other women, I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes when I had my oh. first child. They told me after I had an emergency C-section delivered a 10 pound baby boy, they said, oh, we think you may have had gestational diabetes. Oh, thanks boys. So I was forewarned that this was a thing that was likely in my future, which in those days they said, well, when you get to be 40 ish, you know, you should watch out. So I knew earlier than a lot of people do that diabetes was sort of looming there and I would have to watch it. When I got to be 40-ish, um, I kept asking to be tested and, you know, and finally got someone to do a test. And sure enough, I was tested because I was determined, Philippa, that I was not going to leave my kids. Mm -hmm. I was a single mom. My mother had died when I was 18. So she was young. She was in her 40s. Mm -hmm. And and your whole life is so colored by the death of a parent when it's early, I think, in your life. It's mm -hmm. very influential in everything that you do. And so I started learning earlier in my life about what to eat, what not to eat, and realizing how little good information was out there. I mean, lots of contradictory stuff, mm -hmm. lots of stuff that just didn't quite make sense to me. And we didn't have internet and we didn't have, uh, you know, YouTube and, and we didn't have podcasting and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So we were out sort of floundering in the, the dark when it came to good medical information. Um, so I just began to make a study of it. And so it was never that I was sick. Right. It was that I didn't want to be sick. Mm. And, and I figured out that there was stuff you needed to do to not be sick. You know, as time has gone on, we now have this epidemic. I mean, it's worldwide. We, the United States, I'm sorry to say, has exported their bad health 
and their big food, bad food, mm. to the whole world. And we we have a bad situation here that we can. Okay. And this is where the grandma and me kind of comes in. We could fix this relatively simply if we just decided to do it. We've got some stuff, people, that we need to change. And one of them is the way we eat, which reflects the way we grow food. Mm. And um, we need to stop eating crap. Yeah, well, you, you, I'm, I'm on board with you, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, you know, the slow food revolution or real food revolution, all those revolutions I'm totally on board with. <laughs> those are the ones. Yes. Yeah. And when you think about how, for an example, and I don't know in the UK if this is anywhere near the way it is in the United States, but people here in especially certain parts of the country more than others, swill soda pop constantly. And we are a mess as a result. And when you think about every kind of problem involved with making that soda pop and delivering that soda pop and bottling that soda pop and then getting rid of the trash from that soda pop, not mm. to mention what it's done to your body. Mm. Uh, this is a thing I think we need to look a little more carefully at. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, I, I can definitely speak to this because of having lived for four years in Colorado. That's a fascinating <laughs> phenomenon called the free refill, which, um, you know, was was at the time a kind of a, a revelation to me. But now, of course, having come returned home to the UK, uh, and I've been back 10 years now, and, and I'm seeing now in the UK the kinds of industrialized food that, that I was seeing back then 10 years ago in the States. So there's absolutely no doubt that we are on that trajectory. And, uh, you know, I was listening to the radio the other day where somebody was talking about, uh, you know, the drive-through phenomenon. And that, you know, you had that before we got it, uh, probably why we're getting it. This is something now that we're seeing so much of. And honestly, I mean, it's kind of handy when you're on a journey and you want to stop off but not have to get out of But Jennifer, this is what it does, is it takes families away from the table. Yeah. Because yeah. We, we have some things coming together here. We have moms who are working, all of us. And, and so you're keeping the house, you're doing the kids, you're, you're doing a career, and I want you to cook too, you know, because what's going to go out of the wagon? What can you outsource? Easy and convenient to drive through. And not only is that reflected in the quality or lack of quality in the food that they're getting, of course, you're spending a lot of money and people are saying, well, food's so healthy, food's so expensive. No, it's not compared to what you're paying for drive through. Uh, but also culturally, you've given up the time at table, which is where you teach your children the stuff that matters, mm. who you are, who they might be, what's going on, what do they think. It, you know, you're teaching your children how to argue, how to make a case, how to use their napkin, how to use tools. Okay, am I old timey and thinking that maybe knowing how to use utensils is a good thing? I think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think this is this is it, isn't it? You know, family meals, yeah. such a valuable opportunity for sharing. You know, what's been happening in your day, uh, quality time together, and and life skills that that are in danger of becoming extinct. You know, as you say if we're not careful and um the life skill of cookery is is sadly uh, in danger of extinction because that you know if we if parents are not cooking uh, regularly food made from scratch then how on earth can uh, young people That's can right. glean it for themselves you know i'll confess to you that that my recent book brownies for breakfast was partly motivated by wanting people to see how easy it is. It's simple. It doesn't have, I'm a lazy, messy cook, but 
I know how to get a meal on the table in 15 minutes because I was a single mom. You know, we would come screeching in like you do from a long day and um, activities and my work. And everybody was hungry. And But the kids knew that they had a role. They had things they needed to do. And I was going to have that warm food on the table in 15 minutes. So that was that was my superpower. And there are so many things now that make it possible to put a great, you know, you have your Instant Pots and your microwaves, mm-hmm. these things. So you can combine knowing how to do healthy, good, real food with getting her done, you know, get it on the table. What I know is all the cheaty ways to make it look like I've been in the in the kitchen all day, but I wasn't, you know, I just got home and did some stuff. So that's that's what I'm selling here. I'm saying you can do this spending very little time and energy. Your kids can do this. Your grumpy 85-year-old uncle can do this. It's easy and it's fun. It, there's nothing mysterious or difficult about it. Just here's here's how. And I'm also a huge believer in using what you have. My stuff, you'll see, you know, it's like five ingredients, six three, two ingredients. And then you go, wow. So yeah, you can just make this out of those two. That's right. Because I don't want you having to run to the store to get these three spices and that special grease and the, you know, making sure you have it. No, no, no. I want you to look in your cupboard, take stuff you have and make it great. Make it what you want. I'd love to hear one of your uh, wonderful recipes, uh, Lynn. You, you've called the book Brownies for Breakfast. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, I guess, it's slightly intriguing, bearing in mind this is a cookbook for diabetics. So I'm curious to know, first, what on earth is making that uh, brownies tasty and uh, delicious? And it's so good, by the way, that the little village store up the road sells them very successfully. (laughs) And I coached them to tell people afterwards that there was no sugar in it. If you tell them up front, a lot of people go, oh, no, thanks. You know, the idea being that if it's healthy and sugar-free, it's going to be awful. So these are made of nut butter. And I like almond butter, particularly you can use cashew butter. You can do it with peanut butter. You get a different flavor. If you like peanut butter, it's great. But nut butter And then secret ingredient, you ready? Canned pumpkin. So nut butter, pumpkin, cocoa powder, eggs, if you have them and you're not vegan and you like them and they're from college-educated, well-adjusted chickens. (laughs) Um, I recommend those. But if you're vegan, use egg substitute. That that works fine. Baking soda. Um, What am I forgetting? Cinnamon. Cinnamon is so good, particularly for diabetics. Uh, And there you go. I I don't think I'm forgetting anything. And you put it all in one bowl and you stir it up and you dump it in the pan. Was there any flour in there? No, ma'am. Because I don't want you eating flour. If you're diabetic, particularly, uh, wheat is quite Mm. often not your friend. Uh, You do want to keep your carbs limited. And which you can do, by the way, without measuring anything. You just go, oh, yeah, wheat. Hmm. Not a great idea. Um, and if you're not eating sugar, that's huge. Immediately, that takes a whole load of carbs out of your diet. No mm. sugar of any kind. And people say, well, what about maple sugar? And what about honey? No, they're sugar. Um, fruit, different deal. And by the way, there's still an argument about honey. People are still going, yeah, but honey has benefits. And so maybe if you're nerdy about food like I am, look it up. Food geeks unite. Oh, here's what I left out of the recipe. Go on. Important thing. It's the sweetener that I recommend. Oh. And I have a, a, a chapter, a short chapter in the book on sweeteners because there are some new to the market or recently to the market sweeteners that are great. No aftertaste, no disturbance of any kind. So easy to use. One of them is allulose. It's a natural sugar. It looks like sugar. It tastes like sugar. It cooks like sugar. It's fantastic. Allulose. Another one is chicory root, if you can get it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Natural product. 
It, in the book, it lists a number of different sweeteners, but, but they're non-caloric. And for diabetics, you don't have any kind of an insulin reaction, blood glucose reaction. So you get to eat sweets as long as you make them with my recipes. <laughs> <laughs> the book has pies, cakes, pancakes, all those things. It also has savory recipes mm -hmm. uh, that are you know, particularly good for diabetics. But guess what? Everybody should be eating as if they were diabetic. Yeah, well, I mean, if you don't want to go down that path, that's definitely one way of uh, avoiding, isn't it? And kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And with every day that goes by, I see more and more research about how, yeah, if you eat real food, this is a real food revolution, a real food diet, I call it the snarky grandma diet, but it's the same thing. Real food. Um, it, it's just being sensible. Don't eat crap. Don't eat processed food. Eat real food. Eat a variety of foods. Um, no sugar because it's processed crappy food. So once you go, oh, just no sugar, that's it. But then you start looking at what's it. Because the other tricky thing is you have to read Every label, if it's in a jar or a box or a bag, you have to read that label and you will be, if, you ha if this hasn't been your habit, you will be shocked. You know, and I think it sometimes is intentionally confounding what you find on the labels. <laughs> hey, absolutely. It's, it's hidden on purpose. And for example, the sugar in, in the product is going to be referred to in a number of different ways. It multisyllabic stuff that purposely is beyond people's ability to understand what exactly it is. Yeah. So this thing that they've broken into five segments, because you're supposed to have on the label what what is most is supposed to be first on the label. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you if you if it's if your sugar is made up of five different chemical things, then you oh. can do five, right? I, you know what? I hadn't even thought of that till just then when you said it. But yes, how true that is. I, I wondered why there were so many different kinds of names for sugar on a label, and that is so that it's not the top ingredient. If you actually sat there in the grocery store and calculated how much sugar was in that, mm. and plus a thing that I point out in the book is that. Those labels are not accurate. They can't be accurate when you start thinking, okay, two carrots grown in two different places with two different kinds of, you, know, you can never have the same exact uh, profile on those two products, but it's all mostly designed just to get you to take it home and eat it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's not intended to be thought provoking, is it? But that's the thing that really we should be doing as much as we possibly can. And, you know, we know that these are busy people with busy lives. But by the same token, um, you know, food is such a big part of ritual, isn't it? Food isn't just food. No. It's communion. It's mm. community. Mm. It's family. It's friendship. Mm. It's war and peace literally. <laughs> and I've, I've told the story more than once about having some local folks here, because I'm active in my community, having some local folks here, there was a dispute about some stuff, ha bringing them into my home, having them at my table, they wouldn't eat my food. What does that tell you? Offer a peace offering. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And if someone does not accept your peace offering, it's war. I said that war. <laughs> Oh, that's not funny, is it? Well, it's reality. That's mm -hmm. that we forget what a deep connection mm -hmm. this is. And that's why you're going back to the drive through thing. Food isn't just food. Food isn't grab it in a bag and hork it down, you know. Mm -hmm. Food is sharing and looking and breathing. Mm -hmm. and there's fragrance, there's appearance, there's beauty in food. Absolutely, there's beauty in food. Mm -hmm. If you're missing the beauty in food, if you have the good fortune to have food and and have options on what food you're eating, be grateful. 
Have you ever been presented with food that's just so gorgeous that you just want to go rub it all over myself? You know, it's so wonderful. Um, I bet you've got some uh, kind of uh, face masks in there, have you? That you you know, food that you could probably uh, use for beauty purposes. Rub it on your face. <laughs> well, avocado, great example. Yes, isn't it? If you're able to get avocados, and when they start looking a little funny, rub them on your hands, on your arms, on your face, in your hair. If you take them upstairs and use them to condition your hair. It's vitamin E. It's this wonderful oil. It's great. Oh, yeah. And Do you know what? I I did chop off a bit of avocado and throw it in the bin the other day. I'm never doing that again now, Lynn. Put it on my hair. Yeah, and let it sit on your hair and then rinse it out. I mean, I think I think this, for me, you know, prevention is better than cure. And I, I wrote this in something the other day, and I was getting my husband to proofread it, and he said, what do you mean prevention is better than cure? Oh, please. Uh, nobody's interested in that, are they? You know, and so this is my passion, really, that as much as possible, we do the things in our everyday lives that are, you know, that uh, for the future. Here's what I want to tell your husband and all men oh. is, yeah, you can be that way and talk that way until you get erectile dysfunction. <laughs> And then you will want to have this conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you can just not get it. And here's how. Yeah. Yeah. The serious thing is that um, type 2 diabetes is a, is a condition to, to be taken seriously because, you know, not just because we then have to start to watch what we eat, but because of all the other health ramifications that go along with that serious you know potentially right. serious health ramifications and so you know it's a path to be avoided at all costs is is what i would definitely say well it sneaks up on people it's a mm -hmm. silent killer and it's preventable mm -hmm. and reversible i am no longer in diabetic territory i don't test diabetic at this point mm -hmm. And that's what I want for you. We have now an industry in the United States of dialysis care, which is when you go in and get your, your blood cleansed so that your kidney doesn't totally fail. And the reason we have that billions of dollars industry is because of diabetes. You know, talking type 2 diabetes is is definitely ramifications of, of our lifestyle choices. Yeah. And uh, they do make it difficult for us, is what I would say. You know, I, I have, like I said, I've lived um, in the States. I've lived in Scotland also in the United Kingdom. And uh, because I am an avid label reader and have been for a long time, what became apparent when I lived in Scotland was that processed foods in tins, just, you know, say that. I know where you're going with this. So, well, what was interesting was that the sugar content and the salt content was different in different countries mm -hmm. to accommodate to different palates. And so actually in Scotland, there was more sugar and more salt in this product that is processed uh, you know, and you kind of would assume that around the world, everywhere, it's the same. But no, they're actually uh, tailoring this this product to our preferences. And in a way, by doing that, they're just reinforcing what is a faulty sense of taste. You know, I'm going to throw that out there, that when our palate is used to that the level of salt and sugar that we are exposed to, then then we just kind of get numb to it, don't we? And another thing to consider here is that there are foods that are outlawed in Europe or in the UK um, that are that American manufacturers are happily putting in our processed food, dyes, mm -hmm. preservatives, things. Red dye number three is a famous one. Um, so, yeah, what is considered entirely unsafe in the UK is just fine in the United States. So that ought to give people pause. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Once you start reading those labels, like I say, it becomes quite a, a bit of a hobby, doesn't it? And anyway, if we can fill our trolleys with things that don't have labels at all, then uh, making progress. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I love to encourage people, especially people in the kid raising uh, times of their lives, 
kids will eat what kids grow. Mm. So whenever the complaint comes, well, my kids just don't like, they won't eat vegetables. Yes, they will. If they grow them and if they cook them. And I don't see enough parents now, because parents are so supportive of kids' language lessons and their baseball and this and that. And they're not teaching their kids to cook. Mm. Does that make any sense at all? To me, it doesn't. Well, no, I'm not quite a grandma, but uh, but I do have quite a few years under my belt. It was, for me, very important that we ate as a family all the same foods. There was not one meal for one person and a different one for somebody else. And we see that all the time now. It's little Courtney's going to get her, well, she won't eat this, and then grandpa yeah. Touch that. So uh. this is not for people who have allergies. This is, no. you know, this is a different scenario. In a way, this is a cultural thing, and it's a, it's a. I'm, I'm constantly by certain people in my family, I won't name, being accused of being a boomer now. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I was born in 1946, um, but at my house, I didn't have time for that. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, you know, there isn't one size fits all, but it's for people to find a way. But if we can find our way back to real food, I'd be really happy about that. Well, thank you. And that's that's what I'm hoping for. And, and to me, the answer is to understand how approachable and doable and simple real food is. And here's, a, here's another thing that just knocks me out. Everybody in the United States is watching cooking shows on TV. Everybody, they're watching the chefs do this stuff. Yeah. Then they go drive through. Mm, they they well, don't actually cook themselves. Yeah. They're just watching. Now, I'm sorry, that doesn't even begin to make sense to me. What is the fun of watching somebody do that? And I mean, if you were learning how to do mm. it, I don't know. I just, I like to uh, fix up some grub and then eat it. <laughs> And I like it to be really good. Um, yeah, and I mean, quick matters, definitely. Um, and, I, and I do, a bit like you, think to myself, there's nothing that I can't rustle something up in 20 minutes that turning the oven on to put something in to, that came in a packet would take me as long is, is basically what I'm getting down to here. You know, the, it can be quick is, is the thing. Maybe it takes a bit of planning. Yeah, there's strategy. Yes, yeah, a little yeah. bit of planning, absolutely. But again, you're teaching your children that they need to think ahead about some stuff. You are going to be hungry when you get home. And this is how we'll deal. And what do you think? And what would you like to have later? Um, I, I put a recipe up on Facebook yesterday, the day before, to remind myself and others that uh, oven fried sweet potatoes are one of the most deliriously delicious foods in the universe and all you do you don't peel them you cut them up put them in the oven and when they come out 15 20 minutes later 30 minutes later depending on your oven and the temperature there is nothing more divine to eat and your kids will love those especially if they've done the knife work people go wait you let your kid yes i teach my kids how to use a knife a kid who has cut up a sweet potato and baked it is a kid with some skills and they know it. And kids love nothing more than being competent, being able to be really part of the team. Very often when they go to college, which very quickly they do, right? And they go away from home. They're the only one on their floor or whatever who can cook, who can wash clothes, who can do these things. And I, I didn't want my kids going out in the world, not knowing also Philippa, i i have heard it's so interesting to, uh, my kids are now in their late 40s mm -hmm. mid to late 40s which is so weird right wait how did that happen um and my youngest just had her first baby she was 43 when she had her first baby oh. and uh, of course who walks on water <laughs> this is the most wonderful child with the exception of maybe my other grandchild, who is also the most wonderful child. But my kids now are talking to me in a way that they didn't when they were in their 20s, let's say. And one of the interesting things to me that they've said, which I didn't really understand, was that sitting around the dinner table with me was like a grad school marketing class. I was in advertising and marketing. Um, so that was what I talked about. Parents are teaching all the time whether they're aware of it or not. And it's not what we say, 
right? It's what we do. Mm. It's what our kids see us doing. Well, it's a teaching moment is, uh, is what we're saying. And uh, maybe we're not all marketing professionals, but we've all got skills that we can pass along that may just come in handy. It might be how to balance your checkbook. <laughs> Clearly, we could talk and talk and talk, um, put the world to rights. But wait, we're done? No, but there's so much to do here. We've got work to do. Well, we have got work to do. You're not wrong there. We're still climbing this hill and we're going to keep climbing it. And maybe Lynn's book should be on your list of things to have a look at. Have you got one there, Lynn, for us to have a look at? I just happened to have one. Oh, this wow. Is, this is the that. paperback. And I want you to know that it's lots of women. How do I do it? Pictures. Oh. Okay, there's one. That's a donut that you make at home in a, a donut pan. You bake them. And they are a meal. They're delicious. They're super healthy. What kid is going to turn down a pink donut with sprinkles on it? I don't know one myself. <laughs> but, but it's it's super healthy, good, real oh, food. Oh, yeah. It looks beautiful. I must say the photography is fabulous. I, I mean, I, I'm addicted to cookery books, I have to confess. And uh, I made it. We made a cake in this house yesterday with grated parsnip in uh, Lynn. I bet you'll approve of that. I do. I, I've got there's a carrot cake recipe in here. Lots of pumpkin stuff because I love pumpkin. Oh, this yeah. one holding up is a, kind of a thing that men seem to really love. Red mm. pepper soup. So easy. I mean, you just throw this stuff in a blender and boom, and then you put a little garnish on it, and people go, oh. <laughs> Right? And you did practically nothing. <laughs> well, quick and easy, you've got you got me at quick and easy and right. uh, healthy to boot. So, well, well, thank you so much for coming along and chatting with us on the podcast today, Lynn. It's been lovely to chat yeah. and meet you. Yeah, and maybe we can do it again. I don't see why not. Because we've got work to do, Philippa. Uh, yes, I, I'm afraid we do. <laughs> We've got a whole world full of people out there who need to know this stuff. <laughs> yeah, this is very true. Well, I'm going to say thank you again. You know, keep up the good work. You're you're obviously going to be busy with grandchildren and uh, putting them straight. But when you've got time to come back and chat again, then I'd be very happy to chat with you. So do take care. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. okay. All right. Take care. Bye you for now, Lynn. Bye. Bye.